today on Aqua Kids. Travel with the Aqua Kids as they learn about the efforts to reclaim New Jersey's Barnegat Bay. Plus, the Aqua Kids discover the benefits of an urban rain garden. So, ready to make a difference? Building a better planet starts with you. everyone at home. Welcome back to another exciting episode of Aqua Kids. I'm Drew. And I'm Katie. On today's show, we're off to explore two very different ways that we can help the environment. Let's dive right in. Okay then, let's get started. Hey guys, I'm here at the 17th annual Barnacid Bay Festival here in New Jersey. This festival is unlike any other. It's all about protecting the environment and most importantly, saving the bay. So what makes the Barnacid Bay Festival so much different than other festivals? Well, it's, we're basically here just to celebrate the bay. We love the bay. We want everybody to recognize how important the bay is to all of us. Our economy, our ecology, just spiritually, physically, everything about the bay is important to all these people. explain the demonstration you just showed? Sure, so I work for the New Jersey Water Association and we're a nonprofit and we assist small water and wastewater systems throughout New Jersey and what I'm doing is a source water protection program so we're teaching people about preventing runoff and keeping our water clean because prevention contamination is the best and the cheapest option so that's what we're doing a little bit of outreach today. So how does your demonstration really work? So the demonstration, it's a groundwater model, so it's sort of like a fish tank and what the kids are able to do is um, put some red food coloring into the model and when you pump on the wells, uh, you could see the contamination move into your drinking water wells and when the color pumps out red, kids get all scared and it's a good visual. So. what we're looking at right here? Yes, we have a collection of sand from all around the world and we bring a sample for people to look under the microscope to see what it looks like. What is the purpose of this demonstration? It's so that people can discover that sand is usually made up according to the ingredients of things that uh, in geography that it might be near. For example, in Hawaii we have the volcanoes, so we have the black sands from Hawaii because of the volcanoes. Or in the case of the Philippines, we have the pink coral that's nearby, so it can influence the sand. In the case of New Jersey, and Sandy Hook in particular, we have magnetite that gives us our black specks in the sand. So you can compare that with sand from Cape May that has a lot of quartz, and that gives the sand a white color. So why do you think it's important to introduce your kids to the environmental awareness this er at such an early age? Well, it's because it's their world, and they have to learn how to take care of it. They want it to be pretty and nice and go to the beach and not stick their fingers in cigarette butts and, and soda can plastic. They have to learn to not put it there in the first place. So, and to take, you know, and help clean it up when they see something bad. It's great to see so many people come out to support the Barnegat Bay. I know. Stick around. Aqua Kids will be right back. Aqua Kids presents another Aqua Kids pop quiz. Rain gardens are a great way to help the environment. How does rain gardening make a difference in your local environment? Does it A, reduce runoff pollution, B, increase runoff pollution, or C, have no effect on the environment? I will reveal the answer after the break. Did you guess how rain gardening helps the environment? The answer is A, reduces runoff pollution. The soil in a rain garden filters out pollutants and improves water quality in nearby bodies of water. Rain gardens use water from roofs and compacted lawn areas. This means that all of the water is filtered in the garden instead of going down a storm drain. Welcome back to Aqua Kids. 
we're headed back to New Jersey to learn about a very cool project called Reclam the Bay. So we're here now with Mr. Rick, who is the president of Reclam the Bay. So Mr. Rick, can you tell us exactly what this is? Well, this is called an upweller. Uh, and it's where we grow baby clams and baby oysters. And in fact, throughout all of uh, the world, they mm -hmm. use equipment like this to grow all kinds of things, turtle, fish, oh, wherever, cool. whatever. The way that it works is over here, mm -hmm. the water is coming in. You can see the water gurgling. So that's yeah. coming out of the bay through a pump. It fills the tank. And then the only way for the water to get out is to come up through these things called silos. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna pull this up. And if you look in there, you see that it's a mesh. Oh. Okay. And what's sitting on the mesh are about 50,000 50, baby clams. That's a lot of them. crazy, they're so little. You wanna see how big they are? You yeah. Reach your hand down in there and pull some out. So what's in your hand there is about 20,000 baby clams. Uh, I usually tell people they're about the size of a poppy seed on a poppy seed roll. Their actual dimension is about two millimeters, if you oh. know what a millimeter is. Yeah. Okay? Really so now small. just put your hands back down in there, okay, and then let them fall off. Oh, they're getting under my nails. Okay. They're living creatures, so we want to be very careful about them. We want to make sure that when people handle them, they don't have suntan lotion or something yeah. like that on yeah. because the chemicals could bother them. They're very fragile at that age. So the water comes up through the bottom of the, uh, of the silo. That's what this is called. Mm -hmm. And the only way for the water to get out is through the spout. It goes back into the trough and back into the bay. So they're only eating the algae that's in the bay water. We don't oh. put any other nutrition or anything else in there. That's that's what they would be eating if they lived in the wild. That's really cool. Okay, now, so you don't specifically like feed them anything. They no, just take in what's they in the take, bay. They take in what's in the bay. And that's the, the our biggest problem. Mm -hmm. Since they live on algae, if there's too much algae in the bay, they can't eat it. You know, it'd be like everybody likes chocolate. <laughs> Imagine if someone it. gave you chocolate fondue, opened your mouth and tried to pour it down. You'd just choke on it. You wouldn't be able yeah. to consume it. So that's the problem if the algae gets too big. That's mm -hmm. microalgae. So this is a more natural alternative to feed them. Well, there's really no reason to feed them anything else. Mm -hmm. First of all, this food is free. Well, <laughs> there's the cost of the electricity for the pump, yeah. but I mean, basically the food is free. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Okay, so that's what they do. They live off the algae. And this is what we're teaching people about the bay and the bay water and what's in it. And the biggest problems about algae spikes. Too much nitrogen makes the algae grow too fast. Do you know where nitrogen comes from? Um, not necessarily. Okay. Waste. Well, yeah, oh. waste, pet waste. People don't pick up after their pets. That's yeah, that nitrogenous sense. waste. But it also comes out of the sky. Oh. And it lands on the hard surfaces like roofs and, and roads and parking lots and docks. And it just sits there until it rains. And then when it rains, the rain flushes all that uh, nitrogen into the bay. The algae that loves nitrogen spikes, and then two kinds of algae. The microalgae that they eat, little tiny microscopic algae, gets too big for them to eat. Oh. And macroalgae that looks like lettuce. Have you ever seen yeah. sea lettuce? Okay. Yeah. That gets so big that when it dies, it falls on the bottom of the bay and smothers everything underneath it. You know where clam clams live? Right at the bottom. Right in the bottom of the bay. So that's that's our real problem about nitrogen. And that's why what we're trying to do is to teach people about the clams. So you get involved in the clams, then you want to know what they eat, how big they get, how they grow, some of the things that Fred told you about. Yeah. So this is that's what we're doing in the upweller. Now the other thing that's interesting about the upweller okay. is all the creatures that live in the bay that get sucked into the pump wind up in the upweller. Now remember, the only way to get out of here is to go through the mesh. Okay. So anything larger than that mesh is gonna stay living in the upweller. So how do the clams help the bay? Well, as I mentioned, they eat algae. They're vegetarians. That's all they eat is algae. Now, the other thing that lives in the bay that's really, really important is something called eelgrass. Have you ever heard of eelgrass? Yeah, mm -hmm. it's awesome. It's called eelgrass because guess what lives in it? Eels. <laughs> turns out that about 90% of everything that you find in the ocean 
at one time or another lived in an estuary. That's what we call the bay, but it's really a lagoonal estuary. So all these things need to live in a place where they're safe from the predators. Eelgrass is a great place for them to hide. So they hide in the eelgrass. Now, when there's too much algae creating too much big, um, uh, <laughs> too much nitrogen, <laughs> creating too much big algae, mm -hmm. then the eelgrass can't grow because it doesn't get enough sunlight. Oh, yeah. Just like grass on your property, your, mm -hmm. your lawn, every grass needs sunlight. Well, when the water is real murky, when there's too much algae in it, then the eelgrass can't get the sunlight, so the eelgrass doesn't grow. One of our biggest problems in the bay is the lack of eelgrass. Oh. And one of the reasons that happens is because of the nitrogen and the algae. So that's why we keep coming back to those things. The shellfish are, are all what we call filter feeders. They filter the water out. So it's mm -hmm. like having, I don't know, 10,000 little filters going like this all the time. Oh. When they do that, since they eat the algae, the water is somewhat clearer around oh. them. So that's the, the symbiotic relationship between the clams and the algae and the bay. So everything is connected. You know, Mother Nature really put a wonderful thing together, but it's got to stay in balance. And you know who messes up the balance? We do. Yeah. 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 That's, that's pretty much that's it. Right. Aqua Kids will be right back. Welcome back to Aqua Kids. Let's change it up a little bit and head to a popular rain garden in New Jersey. Sounds fun. We're here with Angela at the LBI Foundation for the Arts and Sciences in Love Ladies, New Jersey. So Angela, this seems like an unlikely place for a garden of sorts. Like, what do we have here? Uh, well, this is our rain garden, and uh, we are very nestled between Long Beach Boulevard, as you can see behind us, and our parking lot for our facility. Uh, two very hard surfaces that nature found to be the perfect location for a rain garden. A rain garden finds itself we don't find a place to plant a rain garden because it's where a low-lying area where water runs off. So we have hard surface, hard surface, and we had a very grassy, unattractive area here that collected all the water, and we decided that we should make it a rain garden um, and focus on the soil and aerate the soil and put plants in here so that when it rains, hence the name rain garden, a rain garden is it harvests rain. It'll take rain from the sky and go down into the earth and replenish our fresh water supply. And as we go through the layers of our soil on Long Beach Island, this is one of the main uh, soils that we have. And it's very important to understand that we have clay layers in our soil profile. And this is one of the things that really uh, makes, when the rain comes down, makes the water go into the surface water bodies because it makes for a hard surface. And when you start compacting all of these soils together, our gravel, our clay, and our sand, we essentially start to have concrete. Hmm. So we don't want that because we have, like we have over there, that nice flooded area in our parking lot. Even though we have clamshells there, it's not impervious, right. okay? It, 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 is, it is absolutely, all the water's gonna run right through that area um, and go right to our bay. So it's just like having a highway. Just our parking lot's just like the highway, even though it doesn't have blacktop on it. So when we go down, it's like having x-ray vision into the earth. Yeah. So if we could go down, aerate that soil, break up those, those clay lenses that we have in the soil with the nice roots, then we can have a, you know, a, the water infiltrate into the plants. So that's essentially why we planted here and why we have a rain garden. I'm gonna show you guys one of the species we have in the garden, um, right along over here next okay. to our uh, river birch, which is a very common tree that you guys would be familiar with. But next to our river birch here, uh, we have one species of milkweed. If you can look over here, this is swamp milkweed. You can see, I think I have a little tag there. But um, the swamp milkweed, of course, is essential for butterflies. Um, uh, monarchs in particular. The monarch caterpillar um, only eats milkweed uh, in its caterpillar phase. So without milkweed, the caterpillar and the monarch will not become toxic. The, the actual milk in the milkweed makes the caterpillar uh, toxic to predators and it's essential. Um, the adult monarch lays the eggs on the underside of the milkweed. So um, you'll know that you have one. If you see one this time of year kind of flying around the milkweed, you're gonna be a sure bet if you look underneath the leaf and you'll find little white dots and that will be the monarch eggs. So here we have another species of uh, milkweed. 
and you can see it's very different than the other one. We had the swamp milkweed there, which is very different. This is common milkweed. I've been trying to grow this particular species for the last couple of years. Um, last year was the first time I saw maybe three, and we can see how big it has come. Wow. So just like anything else, you kind of bloom where you're planted. So um, when the female caterpillar, uh, the female monarch comes around, she'll try to find a, a smaller uh, one of these to lay her eggs on the underside. So you would always want to start checking underneath here. If you're curious, if you're doing an educational program, you'd start to look on the underside and it's a tiny little white dot that would be um, the caterpillar egg. And it only takes a, a few days for, for the caterpillar uh, you know, to kind of hatch out of the egg. And they don't and, fall off the bottom? Nope. Mm -mm, nope. Oh. And then they just eat their way. They eat these leaves and you can see why they call it milkweed. Oh. Does it taste like milk? I, I wouldn't taste it. If you want to be toxic to predators, you could try it, but I wouldn't. Yeah. <laughs> but that's why it's milkweed. Very, very important, and we have a very big problem um, globally with the decline in our monarch population. Having a rain garden is such a fantastic way to help the environment, and it is still beautiful. That's right. Stay tuned. Aqua Kids will be right back. Here's our top story, public rain garden bulldozed. In recent years, rain gardening has become somewhat of a trend. Groups of volunteers join together to plant specific grasses and flowers that allow rainwater runoff from various urban areas to be absorbed. In fact, because rain gardens are capable of absorbing a large amount of water, they are able to reduce the pollution in small water bodies by up to 30%. Not only do the gardens act as a beautiful attraction, but they are also a very important part of an urban environment. Thus, it was devastating when in the middle of August, a large rain garden located in Princeton, New Jersey, was completely bulldozed over by the Princeton Housing Authority, without warning. Steve Hiltner, a volunteer who helped maintain the rain garden for years, commented on the event. Bulldozing represents a new level of ignorance and indifference. He continues, for six years it provided beauty to passerby and food and habitat to wildlife. And just like that, it is gone. We wish Steve and the rest of the crew luck in dealing with this tragedy. I'm Katie with Aqua News, keeping you connected to our planet. Now back to Aqua Kids. Hey, welcome back. We're headed back to the rain garden to see what else is hidden in there. All right. Now we're here with Mike, and we're gonna be planting some plants to help bring bee population to the area. So Mike, what do we have here? We have seaside goldenrod and a little beech plum, and those are going to help bees in the spring. This will help in the springtime, and this will help in the fall. So what are we going to be doing with these? We're just going to be planting these right here at the entrance of the bee yard. All right, well, let's do it. OK, Drew, we're going to come in. We're going to take care of the bees. All right. We're going to smoke them a little bit. What's that there? This is a smoker. This keeps the bees calm by covering up the alarm scent. Ah. And it keeps us safe and the bees safe. So let's go see the bees. Whoa. So Drew, we always want to give them a little bit of a smoke All right. before we enter, let them know we're coming. So how do the bees here connect to the plants that we just planted? So the plants connect to the bees by the pollen mm -hmm. that they provide and the nectar they provide. The pollen is used by the bees as protein to feed the young, and the nectar is turned into honey and used for energy for the adult bees. Wow, so it seems like all the plants are directly affected by bees. Absolutely. Of course, the more bees, the more plants, because the, the bees pollinate, and the more seeds the plants can make, you'll have more, more next year. So this is something they're drawing out, which is new. Uh, and you can see all the pollen in here. Yeah, I see it all in there. Okay. I heard about a situation with insecticides affecting the bees. What's up with that? Yeah, so that's very true. The insecticides that are used uh, are very harmful to the bees. They are detrimental to their uh, hive because it causes them to become disoriented, lost. They're unable to forage. Um, some other chemicals will also cause problems with the uh, bee's digestion system. Uh, so their immune system gets compromised and they're susceptible to the diseases that are already existing. Um, they're, they're at risk with everything that we use. I would really suggest that you use anything that's certified organic in your, in your gardens to, 
protect the bees. And it's important to associate bees with food if we want to survive. It is very important. Uh, that is how I became a beekeeper. I was originally a gardener and I was not able to grow any food because the bumblebees in my area disappeared and I had to become a beekeeper in order to have my own food. Is there anything we can do at home to help protect the bee supply? Uh, limit the amount of chemicals that you're using and be aware of it. Uh, pick your weeds instead of killing them. Um, or better yet, set aside an area where you can do uh, a no mow, let it grow, let the flowers grow, mm -hmm. and you'll be surprised at the amount of wildlife and uh, insects and animals that you'll see there. Well, unfortunately, we're out of time for today's show. But we sure had a busy day. From learning about Reclam the Bay to exploring a rain garden, we learned about two very different ways that we can help the environment. That's right, Drew. And it was so much fun to meet everyone working at both Reclam the Bay and the rain garden because their dedication to helping the environment reminds us that everyone can do their part to keep our planet green and blue. And so can you. So visit our website to follow us on our journey. And learn how you can come along with us. So together we can keep the world. And the water. A great place to play and explore. And we'll see you next time on, on Aqua Kids. Kids.